Hey everybody, welcome back to Men Need to Be Heard. It's Dan, and we've got an exciting show for you today. So, one of the things that I've often talked about, both on the podcast and on my various social media channels, is what it's like to go to family court, especially as a dad, and especially for me, I've talked about my story the first time I walked in, and boy, was I a deer in the headlights, and what I thought was going to happen wasn't even remotely close to what actually happened. Um, and I wanted to kind of explore that a little bit further. And I have a friend of mine, he goes by the name of Father X, and he has done a, a wonderful job on his YouTube channel of walking guys through what it's the experiences like in family court, things to think about, um, pros, cons of things like representing yourself. So I wanted to have him on the show so he can share some of that knowledge and, and help educate all of you, and honestly, maybe even me, uh, in doing so. So let me bring him on. Hi, Father X. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Dan. It's great to be here with you. You and I have spoken offline many times, and it's just great to be here doing this podcast with you and talking through these issues. Well, I'm so glad you agreed to come on. Come on, excuse me. So some of you may notice that he has an avatar, not his actual picture. Uh, and that's because he chooses to remain anonymous. Um, and I'll let him speak to that as he may wish. Although his avatar looks better than my personal picture. So um, I think I lost that battle. Uh, plus he's got hair and I don't. But anyway, so Father X, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the audience. Tell them a little bit about yourself and whatever else you want to share. Thank you. So I am Father X. I've started a YouTube channel uh, on youtube.com slash at Father X 2022. And the reason I, I created my YouTube channel and made it anonymous is because I went through family court, uh, went through a 40 month struggle to get custody of our son. Um, I was a victim of domestic violence. And even though I was the victim of domestic violence in the real world, when we split up, she went to court lied pretending she was the victim and i watched how everybody in the court system from the police to the district attorneys to the child protective services people to the lawyers to the judges they all just assumed the woman must be right and the man must be wrong and uh she got temporary custody immediately even though that was the wrong choice and it took me three years to overcome that gender bias and incompetence of family court and i knew it was all wrong i knew the system was broken i knew it didn't work and um, I knew I had to speak up about it. And uh, what, what triggered me was during the Johnny Depp trial in 2022, when I heard his stories about him and Amber Heard being together. And it triggered a lot of things because a lot of things that he spoke about, like running room to room to get away from her, that happened to me. And, and I knew that this story, what happened to me was still going on and I needed to speak up about it. And I decided to do it via a YouTube channel and tell my story in a way to educate other dads that are going through this um, and to teach dads the reality of what happens in family court, how broken it is, but not just that, because it's not about complaining or whining. Ultimately, you need to get 50-50 custody or primary custody of your kids. So how do you do that in this broken system? How do you overcome the incompetence of these judges? And I, I made my channel called Father X because I'm just another guy. I'm not special, um, except that I, I got primary custody of my son at the end. But I'm Father X because I can be your son, your brother, your cousin, your coworker. I'm just another generic father who went through the system. Yeah, that's a great point that you make. And I've talked about the same thing in the past. I ended up ultimately winning custody of my children. But our, we, we are all of you that are watching, right? If, if you're a guy that's going through a divorce or been through it, your story and ours, they're all pretty much identical. I mean, obviously, there's variables with all of them. But we're no we're no spe more special than you or any less special than you and it's it's why i have people like father x honest to share those stories and get guys to understand that it's not just them because i think i want to see if you agree with me on this i think one of the biggest issues that men have in dealing with divorce family court any of that stuff is they think it's just them right whatever their scenario is uh they're the only ones going through it um, they think the other guys have it easier. You'll often hear the other side of it, which is, well, my state is the worst, you know, um, 
my divorce has occurred in New York state. And I can't tell you the number of guys that I worked with in New York that said, New York is by far the worst. And then I would work with someone from say Oklahoma and they would say, no, my state is the worst. They're all bad as I think you've covered on your channel. So what's your opinion on that? Do you think one of the biggest struggles that guys face is not understanding or maybe thinking that they're alone in this and, and in reality, their story is really not much different than yours or mine? Yeah, the, I think that's an absolute truth. I don't think most people recognize how widespread it is when you're going through it. Um, when, when I was going through it, we had an appearance in court and then another one a month later and then another one a month later and then another one a month later. And I, I took that as an opportunity to learn about what was happening in the courtroom around me. And I was paying attention to the 20 other cases that were up in front of the judge where everybody speaks for 10 minutes, nobody has any intelligent thought about anything, and the woman gets custody. <laughs> and I, I watched this happening and I, I took notes. And, and after several months, my notes basically told me, hmm, okay, so I've seen 30 other scenarios with these 10 minute appearances and 30 times the mother got custody in this courtroom. I see a pattern, hmm, this is kind of obvious. You know, it's interesting that you said the 10 minutes because I've talked about that before. And, and it's, again, there's a common misnomer that many people, both men and women have that, you know, it's, I always call it my first appearance in court. I walked in there and I thought it was going to be law and order or, you know, mine goes so far back, LA law, right? You're going to be in the courtroom. There's going to be all this decorum and both sides are going to get as long as they need to present their case. And it's all going to be based on the truth. And in about the first five minutes, I realized, holy shit, it's nothing like what I thought it was going to be. And like you, my case, the first appearance, I think it lasted about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, and I walked out of there going, what the hell just happened? You know, there's yeah. this common yeah. belief that you're going to go into court and you're going to get all this time to present your case. And one thing I often tell guys myself is at best, you're probably going to get 10 minutes um, and your judge is going to decide your future and your children's future in about 10, 15 minutes. So you better yeah. be prepared for that. What are your thoughts on that? So I, I break that down into two types of court appearances. There's the 10 minute appearance and then there's the trial. Right. So ultimately, the legal question that has to be answered is there's a woman who filed for custody and then there's a man who filed for custody. And they're each saying, I want custody of the kids and this is how we should break up down custody. And now a judge has to decide. So the very first time you appear in court, there's the father and the mother, maybe one or two lawyers for either of you um, and the judge. And the very first appearance is just one of those 10 minute appearances where everybody's just doing an introduction and the judge has to make a temporary order. Um, until the actual trial and until the final decision. And in that 10 minute decision, uh, what I tell people is the judge is the most ignorant person in the room. And no judge will ever admit this, I think, because they, they, in general, they just don't have any character or integrity, but they've never lived with you. They don't know you. They don't know anything about your case, except what maybe you wrote down in a petition, which might be 10% of the truth because you don't write down your whole life story in a petition. So the judge is the most ignorant person in the room. And I've been in management consulting before where you walk in to see a client, you have to learn their business, learn what's going on, learn the facts, and then you can come to conclusions. Mm -hmm. But in court, they skip that whole process and the judge has to issue a temporary order and that's 10 minutes. And then you have to come back maybe a month later for a follow-up and then another follow-up and status conferences. And during these 10 minutes, you're just doing administrative things like, should we have a guardian at litem? Let's decide. Should we have a forensic evaluator? Let's decide that. Um, you know, what is the father's request? What is the mother's request? What's the witness list? And all of these 10 minute hearings are not designed to figure out what's the truth of the case? What's the best interest of the child? That only gets decided in stage two, which is the actual trial. And then when you start the actual trial, I, my trial lasted, my whole thing was 40 months and the actual trial portion was two years. Mm -hmm. So we had like 16 months of nonsense garbage 10 minute hearings once a month and then the mother brought her forward her case for one year 12 months where she testified like twice in november once in december twice in january each court date is like two hours and she testified she got cross-examined her witnesses testified they got cross-examined the forensic evaluator testified and got cross-examined 
And then for for a year, the last part of the trial, the last year, I testified 14 times over about 12 months. I testified 28 hours. And the whole, my entire testimony was designed to basically destroy every gender biased presumption that the judge was demonstrating to me and to get the truth and reality of my case where I was the victim of domestic violence to make all of that truth come out. Mm -hmm. Most guys don't get 28 hours. That's like a marathon. I think most guys might get three hours or an hour and a half, which is a sham because no judge can figure out reality in an hour and a half. That's not real. That's not how the real world works. Oh, I couldn't agree more with you. And it's funny because your story mirrors mine in many ways. Um, you know, we went through dozens and dozens of short card appearances. And the one thing I often tell guys is that first couple of appearances largely will determine your case in not every time, but in many cases, because once the judge says, well, mom's going to get custody, which is inevitably what they do, they they are very reluctant to change it. And that's why you have to be prepared early um, to stand your ground. And then, like you said, really prepare for that ultimate trial. Now, my trial lasted about a full day, a little bit hair under it. Um, but you, it takes time to get to that point. A lot of guys walk in thinking that trial's happening day one. It's not. I don't, and all the times I've gone with guys to family court, the longest I've ever won, ever seen anyone get in the first couple is maybe 30 minutes. You know, they when they have those initial yeah. ones, they're, they're blocking out. They may have 40 cases in a day. I mean, it's yeah. not unrealistic. So when they do a trial, they'll block out extensive amounts of time or days. Um, and that's where I think a really good thing that you've covered on your channel is that expectation, right? Is talking about that. And what you just talk about now is the, the toughest thing I see with guys is that first initial understanding of here's the reality. You know, it's not what you see on TV. Um, and getting past that is the initial step and preparing yourself. Now, in your case, um, you know, when you think about it, 28 hours of testimony, you know, yeah. I was on the stand for like, I don't know, two and a half, three, somewhere in there. Um, it's exhausting. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's like yeah. they're constantly yeah. trying to trip you up. Um, and I would sit there and go, uh, hold on hold on and the, the thing i've shared before is i kept copious notes of everything that occurred me too so, so one yeah. of the things i did was um i had my attorney for that particular one uh, i raised my hand and said you know i have notes on this can i have them and of course her attorney's like you don't need notes blah blah, blah. objected 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 and the judge ultimately let me have them and having those notes i honestly believe to this day turned the whole thing because it showed that I was prepared and that I had documented everything. Um, so along those lines, can you talk a little bit about, we've talked a little bit about how what you're facing, but how do you start preparing for something like that? Right, right. So um, we had, I lived with my ex for um, a little bit more than a year and, and, we, and she was pregnant when we moved in together. So our son was like, you know, a, a, an infant, uh, until the age of about one when we separated. And while we were going through it, we had many incidents of domestic violence, like four or five of them. There, there she, she would engage in fits of rage um, and assault me physically where I had to block the punches. There were, there were occasions where she, she would start fights and arguments three times a week on average, Dan, about a, a list of 10 topics that she could never resolve and she could resort to each one to start fighting about. And so... We, I was in a place where for three nights a week, I knew I would, she would start an argument from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. to 2 a.m. It was three to four hours a night, three to four nights a week um, for 52 weeks, which is like 150 fights. And we had couples counselors. And as part of this whole process in real life, in the real world for that year we lived together, I took down notes um, in, in an email and I saved it as a draft of on this day, she did this and I did that. She did this and I did that. And so I documented this stuff. And I also filed police reports where I wrote down things that happened on occasions. So I had those notes and those were skeletons because I didn't know I was going to court. I didn't know I would need it later. I just did it for self-healing and figuring out what actually happened today. You know, the next day I, uh, after an incident, I would think, what in the world happened yesterday? Let me just write it down so I can make sense of it. Mm -hmm. So during the 16 months of nothingness in court where we went to court to talk about nonsense, 
part of that time we had the forensic evaluator. Um, that was probably um, six months into the process. We spoke to the forensic evaluator, um, who was a psychologist appointed by the court to speak to me and the mother. And she spoke to us for eight hours each, eight hours of interviews, one on one, an hour of an interview where the three of us, me and my ex and the forensic were in the room together talking. So I had to prepare for that forensic evaluation and already before even trial happened. And so the six months before that forensic evaluation, I was preparing my testimony. And what I did was I had figured out the best interest factors, um, domestic violence, who committed domestic violence, the child's education, who's a better parent to meet the child's educational needs, the child's psychological de development, who's the better parent to meet the child's psychological development. And for each topic, I, I wrote volumes in Microsoft Word, organized it with Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Word, and I just wrote all the stories I wanted to tell. Every incident of domestic violence was like five or 10 pages in, in Microsoft Word, detailing exactly what happened the day before, the day of, the day after, and the repercussions. So I had all of these detailed notes and I would give them to my lawyer and say, read this you know, eight page Microsoft Word document, document about what happened in January. And so I had all of this and I lived it. All of these were just true stories of what happened in my life. And all I had to do during the six months of let's say, um, preparing for the forensic was take my prior notes and expand upon them and give more detail. And so I already had all of that stuff and I memorized it because I lived it. I mean, it was traumatic and it was real. Um, so I could talk about any of it at any point in time. That's what sets you apart from those that don't succeed. I, I'm going to be blunt about it. And I think it's, as I said, it's a large reason why I ended up getting custody is you have to get to that level. I mean, to, to type out 10 pages, and I've done the same, except in my case, you know, computers really didn't exist back then. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was Microsoft 3.1, and which was awesome, <laughs> yeah. um, and Windows 95. But anyway, um, you know, when you go to that depth, which is what you did, and document, I mean, you got to dot your I's, cross your T's. I used to log times, where it happened specifically, the address, all that stuff. That matters. And a lot of guys don't understand. You know, the, the mistake that I see a lot of dads do is they go into family court and they think they're just going to tell the judge what a great dad they are and they're going to get either 50-50 custody or whatever variation of custody you want to go with. That ain't how it works, gentlemen. It's not right. even remotely close to that. You you have to understand that there is a bias. Um, and we can kind of explore that a little bit, but... The presumption in most judges' mind, there are exceptions, by the way. There are some good family court judges, few and far mm -hmm. between, but there are some yeah. good ones. And usually after a couple of years on the bench, the good ones become bad. But anyway, um, the perception that they have is that mom is the better parent by default, and you have to prove that you're a good parent as a dad, whereas mom doesn't. And Correct. unless you can actually, it comes down to credibility, unless you can actually show him that you are credible with what you're saying and document it. And no, it shouldn't have to be this way. You're not going to get, you're not, you don't stand a chance. And that's where yeah. I think that was a very important point you made is that you documented every instance. Now I, I don't have the ability you do to memorize it, that, which is why I had my notes and why we fought so hard to be able for me to be able to have my notes. And the judge asked yeah. to see them, which, again, was a gold wow. mine for me. Wow. He's like, "Well, let me see them before I let you have them." I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> you know. Let, let me add. Let me add two layers of complexity to that, sure, Dan. Because what I said, one is creating the questions, and the second one is storytelling. And so, remind me about the storytelling piece. But uh, so, if I wrote ten pages, it's about what happened on January 8th. There's another 10 pages about what happened June 3rd or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, you're right. And, and then a whole bunch of other stuff in between. However, if I wrote, let's say, you have to tell the stories of what's happening based on the best interest factors. You tell them sequentially over time, like month one, this happened, month four, this happened. And for each one, you hone in exactly on that. So if I'm telling the story about her violence on August 8th, and it's 10 pages that I have written down. In my trial preparation, I knew that I would get on the witness stand and my lawyer would be asking me questions, but he had a 10 page document. We, The way I prepared this, I created my testimony, I created the questions and answers, and I gave it to my lawyer and I said, here's your script, yep. follow your script. And by the way, I want you to edit it and give me thoughts on how to improve it or 
you know, making sure you're not asking hearsay questions. And so he did some editing. But if there's 10 pages of what happened on one day, then I had to break it into questions because I don't get on the stand and my lawyer says, what happened on August 3rd? And then I speak for 25 minutes about that day. That's not how it works. In reality, he's going to ask a question and I might have 30 seconds to two minutes mm -hmm. to answer it. I can't go off on a big tangent. I have to answer that question. And he's going to say, how did the argument start on that day? And I'll say, well, when I came home from being with friends, she was in a bad mood. And, and then we had dinner and she was yelling at me at dinner. Okay. And then he says, and then what happened next? And then I say, well, then she got really angry and she threw a bottle at my head. And when she threw a bottle at my head, I was shocked. And she was really angry and she ran to the kitchen and grabbed a knife, like a, a, a giant knife, like the kind of knife that you use to carve a turkey. And, and then my lawyer asks, wait, how did that make you feel? Well, I felt scared because I didn't know what she was going to do with a knife. And then my lawyer says, what did she do with the knife? And I say, well, she decided, to, she threatened. She said, if you want me to end the pregnancy, I'll end the pregnancy right now because she was about seven months pregnant at the time. And so the whole 10 page story gets broken down into one to two minute answers. And you have to know, you and your lawyer have to know every question and every answer because the worst thing you want to do is me say she went to the kitchen and grabbed a knife. And then my lawyer says, okay, well, what happened the next day? Well, no, there's another hour and a half of storytelling, right? So he's right. got, he, you got to be in sync. You're doing a dance with your lawyer. And if you, if you have a good one, he will listen to exactly what the whole story is so that you can both do a dance. There was a point in time when my lawyer asked a leading question and he wasn't supposed to, but I need, I memorized the whole script. I wrote it so I could just do this all out of memory. And the mother's lawyer yelled at him at my lawyer and yelled at the judge saying, I object. You know, he's asking a leading question amongst the 30 pages of questions I can see he's holding right now. And I laughed because we had 30 pages of questions and the mother's lawyer, they went first, they presented their case. They didn't do anything like we did. We were, we were in our own level. We were in our own league. Um, I was operating so much higher than anybody else in that courtroom in, tem in terms of questioning and answering and telling the story. Um, so, so that's the dance you do, right, in, in terms of questions and answers and telling that story. Um, the other part of storytelling, I, I, I told you that, um, like you mentioned that you testified and you had notes. I think a big part of this, especially with a domestic violence piece is, my lawyer told me that in family court, you know, people hear cases all the time, like the judges and the little clerks in the courtroom and the police officer. All of these people love to hear juicy stories, mm -hmm. my lawyer told me. They love the domestic violence incidents. They like to hear what happened. And so when I testified for 28 hours, I took like five or six major incidents of domestic violence and spread it out over that time. And in between those stories, I talked about what a good dad I was. Um, so that my whole 28 hours was designed to give you moments as a judge where you're really interested because there's domestic violence. And then I talk about things I need to talk about legally about developing my son's edu educationally and um, what a good dad I was and what my background is. And then another domestic violence story to keep them intrigued. Um, and then some more things about our therapists and psychologists. And, and so it's weaving a story that keeps them intrigued, which is kind of insulting because these people are fascinated with my worst memories. Mm -hmm. But I had to tell those worst memories in order to make the judge live in my shoes. I knew for 16 months of pretrial nonsense that the judge was gender biased. The judge was assuming the man must be violent, the woman must be victim. I knew I had to tell real stories to force everybody in that courtroom to live in my shoes day in and day out and see exactly what it was like to live with this woman and her abuse and her control and her verbal assaults and her physical assaults, the fear I had to live with. Um, I made everybody live in my shoes. And I, I kind of forced them. I did it politely. I did it nicely. I told great stories, I think. But I made them live in my shoes, and they couldn't escape that. You know, there's two points I want to I want to make off of what you just said because it was so spot on. First of all, when you're when you're doing your answers to your attorney's questions, you're sticking to the facts. You're weaving in a story, but you're sticking yeah. to the facts. You're not really giving your opinion. You know, you're not sitting there going. Well, this and this happened, and her in her mind, it was this. No, you're just relaying the facts and what you observed. She was angry at me. She picked up a knife, blah, 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 blah. The mistake I see a lot of guys make is, well, you know, she picked up the knife and she was thinking. You don't know what she's thinking. So, right. and that 
destroys your credibility. The other thing, and this is a key point that you made is, and, and I'm chuckling by the way, because one of the things my attorney told me is don't watch the judge, watch the court reporter. Because if you, if, because the court reporter's job is to record everything that's being said and their focus generally is on the keyboard or close to it. Yeah. If you see the, in my case, it was a female every time. If you see that court reporter suddenly look up, you just registered something. And if, yeah. and if she picked it up, the judge picked it up. Yeah. And it is almost like writing a Hollywood movie is the way I would put it. A cross between maybe a documentary and a Hollywood movie. You've got to present the facts of a documentary, but you've got to weave in that story to, to be blunt, to hold interest, right? Yeah. And get... Yeah. Get them on your side. It really does come down to using those facts to weave into your story, tell the story, and convince this judge, and it shouldn't be this way, but that you are a good parent as a dad and that you are doing what's in the best interest of the children because the, ultimately that's what it comes down to. Yeah, everything relates back to what's the, in the best interest of the child. Like the fact that the mother grabbed a knife um, and threatened to end the pregnancy, you know, that's a bad and it sounds bad, but really what's in the best interest of the child? And the ultimate answer is, do you want a child raised by somebody who has impulse control issues, who doesn't know how to regulate her emotions, who grabs a knife and engages in this kind of violence? What's the impact on the child of that? And and you were dead on, Dan, in terms of the, the court reporter. I want you to imagine this, Dan, because I, I like to visualize this for guys. Think about a courtroom where the judge is in the front, and 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 20 feet in front of the judge, there's two tables. M my lawyer and I are on the table to the right. Um, the mother and her lawyer are on the table to the left. Right in front of the judge is the court reporter yep. typing away. Yep. And when I testified, I would walk to the left of the courtroom. And so uh, like in a jury box, basically, and I testified there because there's no jury, but that's like where we testified. And to my diagonally to my left was the judge and below her was a court reporter. Diagonally to my right was my lawyer. So I would look at my lawyer as he asked a question, and then I would turn to the judge and the court reporter, and I would I focused my eyes on the judge. I needed to make sure she was paying attention because internally I was taking my strategy was to take reality and shove it down my judge's throat because she, for 16 months she was being a total bigot and a moron, and I could tell she didn't know anything. So I, I I did it politely. I did it nicely. I you know and I I looked at her eye to eye because in a courtroom, they get phone calls, they get papers handed to them, they get distracted. If I was telling a story, I needed to make sure the judge was listening to every single second, and I looked at the court reporter also to make sure she was typing it. And I'll I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but if the judge got distracted, she would not be listening, and I would pause. Yep. And everybody in the room is looking at me. So I would just stop talking because the judge is looking at a piece of paper and I would stare at the judge and then I would glance at the little clerks in the courtroom and I would see them all look at the judge. And then the judge would look up and everybody was staring at the judge because they're wondering, why is Father X, why did he stop talking mid-sentence? Oh, it's because the judge is distracted. And then the judge would stop and say, okay, I'm sorry, and pay attention again. And that's how I got her to pay attention. I, I wouldn't just ramble on. And for the court reporter, they type up the transcripts that ultimately go to the court of appeals if there's an appeal. So you need to make sure the court reporter is understanding every word you're saying mm -hmm. and getting it right to for the record. So you have to be in sync with that person. That's what one of the arguments I've always made uh, to people is to get copies of the transcripts afterward, which costs can cost a fair amount of money. But yeah. then read them because they they're human beings. I don't fault the court reporters. I could never do that job. You're trying to listen to someone and, you know, they have shortcuts and all this stuff, but they're trying to type everything as accurately as they can, but they do make mistakes. And I don't think it's deliberate in any way, but if you don't have those transcripts and read them and make sure that you say, hey, wait a minute, in this particular section, this isn't correct, um, it could come back to bite you in the ass later on if you end up filing an appeal. So you want to ensure that they're accurate and I'll tell you the other side of it is I can't tell you how many times in later, you know, we, we would have motions for various things. I, having those transcripts and being able to refer back to them when writing the motion or bringing it up in court were huge having that because yeah. memories are faulty. Yes. Your memory is, everyone's yeah. is. 
And yeah. having that documentation, being able to refer to it, again, it speaks to credibility. And unfortunately for dads, it ultimately comes down to how credible are you? Moms don't yeah. have to face that. Um, if we can, I want to kind of just, because you we've touched on best interest of the child a little bit, and I know you've done a series on it. Can you talk a little bit about, one, what's the reality of best interest of the child? Because there is no standard definition. Um, <laughs> as you know, it's however it makes it best for them with their case, right? But how you, how you view it and things that guys need to know about it um, as they're dealing with it. OK, Let, let's talk about what the world should be and, and remind me to talk about how it actually works uh, in the first day of court. Um, so how it should be right. Like People think in, in, in general terms, they say, oh, we have to decide the best interest of the child. But I don't even know what that means, because is it better for the child to live with a mom and play soccer or to live with me and play baseball? Like that's so subjective. Right. And when you think that way, you get lost um, and you get lost in in the wrong area and it goes nowhere so in my mind especially in my case because my ex you know she had borderline personality or borderline personality disorder or bipolar disorder violent anger management issues and i read a lot of psychological journals and articles about child development and what's the impact on a child if they see their parent physically assaulting the other parent or cursing or having anger management issues or grabbing knives um and so I know that that was all negative on my son, but think about the best interest factors. Think about we're here to figure out what's the best situation for the kid going forward and how do you decide that? Many states have in their laws, the best interest factors are written out. Sometimes they're not written out, but they are in appellate state case law. And I'll go through a few of them. It's domestic violence. If one parent commits domestic violence against the other parent and one parent is violent or has anger management issues, how would that person do at raising a child, knowing that the child now has to deal with that person's anger management issues as a four-year-old, six-year-old, eight-year-old? Like, think about the little child walking on eggshells every day, wondering how much of a bad mood their mom is going to be in or their dad. So that's one factor. Another one is the kid's psychological development, right? How do you, how do you promote... Um, your kid's ability to grow and learn and ask questions and make mistakes without being constantly criticized and yelled at. I mean, how many times do you see mothers on the street yelling at their kid? Hey, you're stupid. Why did you do that? Why did you drop that ice cream cone, you stupid moron? You know, that sort of stuff like that's really bad. Um, or a mother who complains to the child saying, your dad is five minutes late to pick you up. You see, he hates you. He doesn't like you at all. He, you're an inconvenience to him. And putting all of these negative things in the child's head, that's really detrimental to a child, right? So, so there's another factor called the psychological development of the child. All those things really hurt a child. So if a parent is doing that, that's really bad. And, and it's not good for a child to be primarily raised by that person. But that person should be like the alternate weekend parent who has minimal effect on the child. Or maybe there's a parent who's much better for the child's education where one parent doesn't even care if the child goes to school, but the other one has a mission to get that kid to go to MIT, right? And, and is teaching them math, right? What situation is better? There, there's like scientific and methodical ways to think about what's better for a child. And I go through that in my series in episode five and episode 11. I talk about what those best interest factors are scientifically and methodically so that you can talk about how you do those things better than the other parent. Because in many cases, both parents are fine parents. In many cases, it's lopsided and one parent is just so much better. But nobody knows the answer in your case, so you have to figure that out. If you think you're both equal and fine, then you're justified in saying, we should have 50-50 custody because we're both fine and the kid needs both of us. But if the mother in your case is a psychopath or vice versa, or one parent has an alcohol problem and is, is drunk five days a week or has a drug problem so they can't really care for the child, then that makes it more lopsided. And if that's the case, then that's the case. And you have to make a parenting decision to account for that. So I think the best interest factors are supposed to be scientific, um, um, even though they also can be subjective to a certain extent. Um, do you want me to tell you how it really works? Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm looking for. This, this by the way, if I can just interrupt for one yeah. second. I want everyone that's watching this podcast that's going through a custody battle to now rewind the last three minutes and re-listen to what he said. 
because everything Father X just said is going to determine your success in getting custody or being 50-50 custody. Every single word he just said is the crux of it because it ultimately does come down to best interest of the children. And you have to look at it both from the science, I'll call it scientific or logical or methodical. I use different phrases with it. Um, yeah. As well as realizing that there is a subjective component and that's what's working against you more than anything because they presume mom does all the great things automatically, dad doesn't. And you need to overcome that. Sorry to interrupt, but go ahead for yeah. the second part. No, you nailed it, Dan. Thank you. So the second part, let me let me give you a quick story about baseball. And then I'm going to connect it to family court in my first day in family court. Let's say, Dan, you and I are trying to find a third baseman for our baseball team, right? You You and I create objective criteria. The objective criteria, we have two candidates to be our third baseman, right? Just like in court, you have a mom and dad who can be the primary custodial parent. Well, if we're going to pick a third baseman, objectively, you and I would say, Let's evaluate. Is it a gold glove defensive player um, or is it a strong defensive player? Do they have a great throwing arm? Criteria two. Criteria three. Do they have great range on defense? And now let's talk about offense. Criteria four. Do they have a 300 batting average or do they have a 200 batting average? Do they have a low batting average? Um, criteria five. Do they have a, hit a lot of home runs? Do they hit 30 home runs or two home runs? Criteria six. Do they strike out a lot? Um, criteria seven. Do they walk a lot? Um, criteria eight, are they fast? Are they good at base stealing? So I'm evaluating these third basemen on eight things, right? I'm supposed to literally ask about eight things and understand those eight things and pick out which one is better at six or seven of those. Or maybe if one of them is better at five and the other one is better at three, maybe the one that is better at three, I really need those on my team given my other players, but I have criteria. If I was a complete bigot, and incompetent at baseball, and I chose wrong, my methodology would be this. I would say, well, my starting point, I know I want to pick player number two because I just like that guy more because that's the mom. So I, I already made my choice. It's player number two. Now my next step is to back into the reasons to justify that. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, well, player two strikes out less and player two hits uh, more home runs. And because of that, I'm choosing player two. And I ignore six other factors completely. I pretend they don't exist. And I say, because player two strikes out less and hits more home runs, that's the reason I'm choosing that one. And it sounds good. It sounds nice. But it's not the complete story. Um, does that make sense, Dan? Well, it's funny. I'm, I'm sitting here as you're talking, shaking my head going, yep. You know why? Because one of the things... My ultimate, I, I went through three attorneys before I found D1, and she was amazing. Um, but one of the first things when I met with her that she did was essentially a T-square, which is what you're talking about, right? She mm -hmm. said, I want you to tell me five things about your ex that make her an awesome mom. And mm -hmm. I'm, now, keep in mind, yeah. there's a lot of animosity at this point. And I, I remember going, what the... Why is she asking me this? Yeah, you But it know. was crucial. Absolutely it was. Um, because everybody focuses on the negative. What's the positive, right? Because you're trying, again, we're talking about you're trying to paint a picture. And as my attorney ultimately said to me is, when they come at you, they're going to do nothing but show negative. They're going to throw everything they can at you to paint you as a horrible human being. We're not going to do that. We're going to point out, the negatives, but we're also going to point out the positives because in doing so, you're showing the judge that you're not going to alienate the, the kid. You're going to, you want to ensure what's best for the children, that they're going to have both parents and all that. It's in a nutshell, what you're kind of talking about, right? Is you want to look at it as what are the pros and cons for both of you and how yes. are you going to work together as, you know, a non-couple now, but to raise this child. And when you can do that, you're showing the judge ultimately that you're doing what's in the best interest of the child. So your your point, I was shaking my head like crazy going, yep, 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 yep. <laughs> yeah, because what you're doing, what I do on my channel in episodes five and episodes 11 is I create that scorecard on the screen. And for each of the 12 best interest factors, 
um, they're, they're one row for each one, um, um, methodically, right? You're, you're creating columns that say the dad is good here because of all of these facts. The dad is bad at each one because of these facts. The mom is good because of these facts. And the mom is bad because of these facts. And on top of that, for each factor, you also have to think about the false allegations. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to address those. Um, and, and your scorecard is your internal scorecard of why should you be the primary custodial parent? Your positives should outweigh her positives and your negatives should be less than her negatives. And if you're going to talk well about the mother, unfortunately, this becomes a game. Which And, and, yeah. and if you're going to say something good about her, you can't make her out to be such a great parent that she's better than you. But you know, you can take um, some facts and say she's good because she's good at taking them out on walks in nature. You know, and okay, fine. You know, you, you give her some points, but big picture, the total sum of all the good and all the bad for both of you should be that you should be the primary custodial parent. And if that's not the case, then what are you fighting for? Well, that's the other, that's a great point, right? Is you got to take the emotion out of it. You know, saying I'm a great dad, like I talked about earlier, is not going to win you custody. You've got to do exactly what, what Father X is saying is go bullet point by bullet point pros cons for both of you because ultimately that is what is and i hate the term but it is what's in the best interest of the child and you have to acknowledge that maybe mom is better at some things than you take that emotion out of it again you made a very good point you're not trying to make her case for her what you're trying right. to do is present it that you want to co-parent with her because they're going to come at it and, and i saw it in my case and pretty much every case i've ever observed the mother's attorney, it's not even the mother, it's the attorney more often than not, is going to do everything they can to paint you in the worst possible light and show there's not a single positive thing about you. And you're trying, again, we're going to that Hollywood script. If you can say, yeah. you know, she takes her, she takes our son for a walk in the park every week, and I think that's awesome. But, oh, by the way, I do the same, right? Yeah. Or yeah. I do this, I do that. You're acknowledging her contributions and highlighting yours as opposed to saying, well, I take him to the park all the time, but the dad never does a thing, which is exactly what they're going to do. Yeah. And that's how you, that's how you break the bias. Cause that bias is there. You know, one thing I always talk about with best interest of the children is it's just a renaming of the tender years doctrine. You know, I, I firmly believe that it's no different. They just renamed it. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what, what do you think about that? About the well, I remember the tender years doctrine as just a statement that if a child is one to five years old, they need to be with a mom. But that completely ignores what happens when the kid is five to eighteen years old. What's what happens then? And yeah, who's but they the don't change. Yeah. So the tender years doctrine is pretty. It depends on who you talk to. It's one to five or one to eight. Who is the primary parent? They always put it as primary parent, not mom. But it's obviously almost yeah. always mom. Um, but then they never change afterward. That's that's a key point. And reality is, if you look at best interest of the children has its applied, not what's written in the laws, it's basically the tender years doctrine re re narrated, as I like to put it. Yeah, yeah. And I was also going to add that um, my first day in court going on that baseball analogy about how if you're biased, you pick the player that you want and then you back into the reason. I noticed that my first day in court. And in my video series, I have episode number six where I describe my first day in court and I make another um, video in episodes number six about your first day in court to teach dads from what I learned. And when we went to first court, the very first day was about maybe 30 minutes roughly. And I had I filed petitions and in order for an order of protection and custody and I highlighted all of the incidents of violence that the mother engaged in, her knife wielding, the time she pulled knives in arguments, her anger management problems, things about her therapy sessions where they said she had anger management problems and borderline personality disorder. And during that first day in court, the, the this referee lady decided the mother would have primary custody um, only because the mother was unemployed at that time. For the year that we lived together with our son, she took maternity leave. We raised our son together for three months. I was a stay-at-home dad because I had saved enough money at that point in my life where I could take time off and be a stay-at-home dad. And that's what I wanted to do, raise my son. We were together for three months and then she went back to work. I was his primary caretaker. I was taking care of him at home all day, changing diapers, feeding him, and just falling in love with this beautiful kid. Um, and 
I was a primary caretaker. And then we went to court. When we went to court, it just so happened that I got a job the month before because I knew I had to leave and I needed a job to do that. And she was unemployed. So that first day in court, on that day, it happened she was unemployed. And the referee said, well, I'm giving the mother primary custody five days a week because she's unemployed and the father has a job. So he'll have custody every Friday night to Sunday afternoon. And and only because she's unemployed and the referee never even bothered to read my petition. She actually said it. She never read my petition that said the mother grabbed a knife and threatened to end the pregnancy. The mother had many threats of ending her own life and self-deleting. The mother engaged in violence. The mother has a history of violence. All of those best interest factors, gone. The referee only chose what she needed to do to give the mother custody. And it was, I walked out of that courtroom, like you said before, Dan, like thinking, what the hell just happened? Yeah. And that's what happens. You don't really anticipate that judges will actively hide from reality. They will actively ignore what the father says. If the mother accuses the father of domestic violence, which mine did, and I counter accused her, they put no effort into figuring it out or asking questions to figure it out. They just ignore it. And whatever happens, the mother just ends up with default temporary custody, which sets the tone for the next two to three years. And ultimately, in many cases, it will be the final decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, can't tell you how many times I've seen that. And, you know, you end up with the standard order, which is every other weekend. And I call it the pizza date during the week, usually. Yeah. That pretty much every state has adopted and they'll deny it, but they still use it. And that has no scientific basis. You know, and ultimately, if you're not prepared for that day one, you're going to run into the situation you ran into. And I, mine is not much different than yours. Um, I knew within the first two minutes, mine was a male judge. He had no idea what was going on. I don't think he read either petition prior, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, judges don't read. They, they don't. And he just said, mom's getting custody and you're you're getting every other weekend. And I'll give you Wednesday nights at from six to eight. And I'm like... I remember sitting there going, but I was the one who took care of the kids more and all that stuff. It never even, yeah. I never even got the chance to talk about it. And that's why, you know, to talk about day one a little bit, let's kind of chat about that. Cause I think it's, if, if I were to say to you, I think this is important. If I were to say to you, what is, if you're going, you know, you're going into court for the first time, what would you say are the top two, maybe three things that dads need to either prepare for or do to be ready, however you want to phrase it? That's a really tough question, given that you're blindsided um, and you don't have time to prepare, but she's probably prepared, right? That doesn't happen all the time. Um, I actually, we, our first day in court was uh, was very early August of, of, of that year. Um, I moved out at the very end of June um, and then we went to court like the next week. Um, I'm sorry, I moved out the end of July. She assaulted me in June while we lived together. And that was, I thought, going to be her final assault. I left for the day and I wrote my petitions for custody and an order of protection. And I, I had my lawyer and we, we drafted our petitions and I was going to file for custody in June. I chose not to on the advice of good friends who said, try to work it out. You don't want to go to court because they're gender biased against dads. It's not a good solution. Try to work it out. And I did not file in June. Um, she kept being violent. And in July, I had to move out. She went to court first. And she filed for an order of protection, which she got instantly, no questions asked. I was not there her first day. Um, and she asked for custody. I was there. We, we had a hearing like three or four days after she was there. And in my first hearing, I thought the uh, referee would read my petition because I had submitted it um, a couple of days before. And I thought... This says everything, but they don't actually read. So you can't assume that they read. You should assume that they don't read. So when you go into talk for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, you have to hit on the best interest factors mm -hmm. and you have to hit on the false allegations. Um, she accused me of these things, but I will prove that they are lies. And it's not in the best interest of our child to have his future determined based on the mother's fraud. That's the absolute worst thing that we can do. And we can figure out the truth. It's easy for me to prove that she's lying. Your Honor, I understand you never lived with us and you don't know the history here and you don't know how she's lying, but it's easy for me to prove it. I have witnesses, blah, blah, blah. Um, also, the goal of that very first day is 
we need to come up with a temporary parenting plan until we sort through this. Mm -hmm. So I propose a temporary parenting plan since the law says we both have equal rights and we have to figure out what's in the best interest of the child. Since we haven't figured out all the details of what's best for the child, I'm asking the court to just issue a 50-50 custody order to start with. I think I should have primary custody for these reasons. But I understand, Your Honor, that it, you would be biased in my favor if you just decided that without a trial. So I'm asking you just to issue 50-50, right? Because you know the judge is going to be biased in the mother's favor by giving her temporary custody. So you kind of flip it and make the judge think, I am noble. I am honest. I'm doing what somebody of integrity would do. Exactly. Since you don't know the facts, let's start off neutral. So that's your starting point. And you have to talk about uh, in my 50-50 plan that I'm proposing, you know, it's it's I have the first three days of every week or every weekend from Thursday night to Monday morning or whatever the exact division is. And you have to make sure it's a plan that you can both execute, especially you. Like you can't say, I want custody all day, but I work all day in a different city. That doesn't work, right? You need a real plan of 50-50 that you can actually execute. And if you need to get a babysitter, you have a babysitter in place. It has to be a plan that can be executed. Well, I mean, you stole all my thunder <laughs> <laughs> because this is exactly what I tell dads is the number one thing you need to have ready. If you're, if you're asking for custody is how are you going to do it? What are the days you're going to have the child? What are the times? What are you going to do while you're working? Well, I going to have a babysitter. Okay. What if the babysitter is not available? Well, then I have, you know, cousin, Irene is going to is going to watch him. You have to have all of that documented as a dad. Yes. Because that's what's in the judge's mind. Well, you know, he says he's going to take care of the kids. How he's going to do it? He already presumes mom's going to handle all that stuff. How's the right. kid getting to and from school? How are you going to handle homework? How are you going to handle the transition from mom to dad? All of that stuff. Now, keep in mind, you cannot write novels and recite them. You get bullet points. Yes. So you're going to say, well, for school, we're going to take the kid, blah, blah, blah. You maybe have two sentences at most on how you're going to handle it. If the judge wants to know more, they will ask. But think bullet points and have a detailed plan because that's your number one goal, right? Is yeah. I want to ensure that I'm still going to be a parent because you could lose. They won't say it, but you could lose your parental rights right then and there if you don't. I, I firmly believe yeah. that. Yeah. And trying to fix it later gets very time consuming and costs a crap load of money. And the reason I know that is you're looking at someone who made that mistake, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. It cost me six figures to ultimately reverse something that if I had handled it better up front, I wouldn't have had to do that. And that's what you're talking about is being prepared. The other thing on that day I- yeah, on day, day one. Yeah, on day one, Dan. And the because other... day, day one, they set a temporary order and then after that, the the legal logic is we don't want we want stability for the child. So we don't want the mother to be primary custodial parent um, for two months and then the father for four months and then the mother. So they kind of the way these people think is if I make a temporary order, I will never change it exactly. until there's a final order. But that's dumb because on day one. You have to fight like hell just to get 50-50 or primary custody because they won't change it later. But a rational person would say, wow, I set that order on day one. I didn't know anything, but now it's month two. Now I learned the mother has serious mental health issues, but I'm not going to change it now. I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I'm going to keep my mistake going. That's really dumb. And that's how these people think. So you're going to be locked in. It's, so it's you have lazy. To like it's hell. nothing short of laziness often that where yeah. they... The, oh, this is what I decided day one. And it's, you know, I got to write up all this stuff and blah, 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 or have the attorneys write it up. Now nah, we'll just keep it the way it is. And, th and that'll be that. And that's what you need to be prepared for. One of the things I often tell guys is you mentioned earlier, you, usually the guys are getting blindsided and they are, you know, women don't just file for divorce a week prior to when they're going to actually do it. They they're masters. And I give them all the credit in the world in yeah. a negative way, but they'll, they'll plan this out for months, like six, eight, 12 months is not uncommon. So they, they have all their ducks in a row and all of a sudden you're going to get handed a, you know, a petition, whatever, but depending on what level they're going to with it, you know, they file for divorce, whatever it is, you're going to get handed it and you're going to get blindsided. And you may have a court date as soon as a couple of weeks later. Um, 
And if, if there's an, an allegation, you touched on this earlier, if there's an allegation of abuse, um, she may have an order of protection issued against you and you won't even know it exists until the sheriff serves it on you. Right. Because it's all done ex parte. So what I always advise, guys, is start looking for some of the signs ahead of time. Um, the classic one being is if she's been nasty to you all along and suddenly she's nice. Or I this, this sounds so bad, but it's true. They do it. If she didn't want to have intimate relations with you and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, she's all set for it. She wants it constantly. She's trying to get you to be unaware of what she's doing. They're trying to hide it. So you got to watch for those signs. But more often than not, the guys get blindsided. And the first thing I tell guys, if it happens, is you need to start preparing right then and there, documenting everything as we've talked about. And then the other thing I encourage them to do is go go to family court and just sit in the gallery and watch. Because yeah. the big thing that guys don't understand, and I, as I've touched on it many times already, but and I was as guilty as anyone, you think it's going to be one way and it gets your eyes open and better it happens while you're watching it happen to someone else as awful as that sounds than it happening to you. Uh, Absolutely. And standing there. Uh, let, let's kind of shift a little bit if we can, Father X, to, you know, you're, you're dealing with it. You know, you've gotten served. You're dealing with that first one. You're trying to find an attorney maybe. You've talked a little bit about finding a good divorce attorney, the pros, cons of using one. Can we kind of touch on that a little bit and explore it? Um, just uh, overall, what, what's your thoughts on divorce attorneys? I know them, but I want the audience to hear them. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say my background is in corporate America as an executive, and I am required to produce good work product. It's just part of life. And I know what that looks like. And I've seen other people do it. And I've seen bad work product. In my experience in family court, I, I can probably list out 30 or 40 people I came across in my 40 months. Judges, magistrates, court clerks, officers, lawyers, um, the mother's lawyers, my lawyers. I, I can say without a doubt that in the years afterwards, I've never once thought, wow, this one person was really smart and insightful, and I would like to be part of their life and ask them advice about this topic. Not even one person. I thought in general they were all incompetent um, and lazy or gender biased. I think in general the lawyers I came across, I think 80 to 90% of them were incompetent, and I'm being generous because that's like a ballpark. It, I could say 95% of them uh, were I would have put it at 95 myself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like there's no depth of thought. Like a little while ago, you and I were talking about the best interest factors and how to think about a child's development. Nobody in court does that. Oh, they'd, like, they'd have no clue. Yeah. When you talk about domestic violence and she says, oh, he abused me. They're like, oh, wow. She said it. Therefore, it must be true. Nobody thinks about what questions can I ask to figure out what's the truth here, um, which I do on my channel a lot. Mm -hmm to helping people to get to the truth because your lawyer probably is not smart enough to know what questions to really ask about your life story in order to get the truth out because your life story is in your head you lived it for one year two years five years your lawyer is walking in clueless and so is the judge and so is the other lawyer if they're going to be effective they have to ramp up their knowledge from zero to a hundred really fast they don't do that no, they don't. It's and it's funny. The mistake, the first mistake I made was not doing my due diligence on hiring a lawyer. Right. Um, the biggest mistake I made was, you know, I talked with a friend of mine. He said, "You're here's my attorney. Go use him," and he was a great guy, but he was not even a divorce attorney. He didn't practice family law per se. Mm -hmm. um, he was I call a general practitioner, if you will, for law, um, and. He was incompetent and, and I'm not faulting him, but he, in the sense that, you know, he did the best he could. I fault him in not telling me day one, you need to go get a lawyer that specializes in family law. And right. had he done that, it would have been a game changer, right? Um, you know, it took me, as I said, I was on my third lawyer till I found one of the good ones and I, I hold her in high esteem. She is the exception with regard to divorce attorneys that proves the rule. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think she had an ounce of bias in her. 
Um, if okay. any, if you're going to argue at all, did she have any bias? It was towards the dads because she, you know, what she would say in the courtroom and what she would say behind the scenes. It was like, OK, yeah, you know, um, and, <laughs> and what I loved about her more than anything else. And this is if you're looking for an attorney, this is what you want to look for is she would tell me what I needed to hear, not what I wanted to hear. Right. Um, yeah. And she would she was not above saying, Dan, you're full of shit. Stop. Right. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I used to write most of my petitions and then give them to her. And she would kick them back to me going, dude, this isn't going to fly. Don't, you know, either rewrite it so it will fly or you're wasting your time. And, and other areas where she helped me was she would say, look, you don't need me in this, especially with like child support issues, right? You don't need me for this. The law's cut and dried. You know it as well as most lawyers. You're, why pay me at the time was $400 an hour for her. You're wasting your money. Right. When you have an attorney that's doing stuff like that, that's one that's that's good. Most of them, however, they're trying to gin up as many billable hours as they can. And yeah. they don't know what they're doing, even though they specialize in family law. Um, and you end up spending six figures is not uncommon. And you walk away with whatever you had on day one anyway, as we've talked about. What are your thoughts on all that? Um. So a lot of dads ask the question, should I get a lawyer or not? Mm -hmm. Or should I go pro se? And I say, that's the wrong question. And I wish I had a magic answer for you, but that's completely the wrong question, unfortunately. It sounds like the right question, but it's wrong. Because th there's what you know today, and there's what you will know in year two. And what you know today is that you have an emergency court hearing and you have to hire somebody super fast. Right. So you speak to a family court lawyer and they sound nice to you. So you hire them because, you know, they're a family lawyer and they've been in the courthouse. You don't have time to really interview them. So you don't know what they're going to be like in court on day one, on, on in month three and in doing the analysis later on um, of helping you understand, is there a forensic evaluator? What are they looking for? How do you talk to the forensic evaluator? How do you prepare your evidence related to your educational development of the child, the psychological development, the storytelling around the domestic violence? You don't know if this person is good. It's impossible to know if this person will be good or not based on interviewing them for an hour or two. So uh, on episode three of my series, I talk about lawyers and, and I, I, I ask 20 interview questions you should ask lawyers because you need to shop around because they're not all equal. Actually, most of them are dumb. Um, they, they say there's a common thing in lawyer world that says family court lawyers are the most incompetent lawyers in the industry. Family court lawyers are the ones who graduated last in their law school. Um, so they're held in low regard and that's for good reason. But I, I, I asked, um, interview questions that I never asked. I wish I did, but I put it in my video series. Like, can you tell me lawyer guy that I'm interviewing for this job? Can you tell me, um, the best interest factors in our state? They should basically be able to rattle off 10 of them off the tip of their mouth. Mm -hmm. Can you give me some key appellate court decisions in our state that talks about the best interest factors? They should be able to rattle that off at the, mm -hmm. at the tip of their mouth. Um, have you ever, how many cases have you won in litigation where you represented the mother and what percentage of the time? Secondly, what percentage of the time have you won custody for the father? How many times and what percentage? Because it's no accomplishment to get custody for the mother at all, but it's a serious accomplishment if you get custody for the father. Um, fifth, have you ever been in this courtroom? How many times have you been in this courtroom? Have you ever been in front of this judge? How many times have you litigated in front of the judge versus appeared in front of the judge? Um, if you have mental health issues in your case, like I did, um, ask, are we going to have a forensic evaluator? Do you, lawyer guy, can you tell me the character traits of somebody with bipolar disorder or borderline personality disorder? If you're in this business, you should know those traits and the impact on children. Can you tell me um, the child's developmental needs? Um, and, and lawyers, when they're selling you in the first meeting, they love to just talk in grandiose terms. Oh, yeah, I'm a great lawyer. I know how to litigate. Those are all marketing slogans. They all use marketing slogans. What you need to do is get into the nitty gritty of the day to day, the day to day job and executing your case. Do they know what they're talking about? And so I did a video helping you understand what those things are supposed to be. And I encourage everyone to go watch that video, which I have. And it is and I'm not saying it because he's 
sort of standing <laughs> in front of me with an avatar, but uh, it was brilliant. And it it's everything you had in there is exactly what you need to do. The thing to keep in mind when you're when you're going to meet and interview lawyers, a couple things. One, it's the most important job interview you'll ever go on or conduct, right? Because yeah. ultimately, it's affecting your life far more and your children's life far more than anything ever would. Um, but understand also that, and you touched on it, you phrase it a little different than I do, where you, you were calling it marketing, but and that's what it is, is they're going to do everything they can to gin up your emotions. Yeah. Uh, they, if they think, because remember, the more they can stir you up, the more money they're going to make, right? Yeah. Uh, and this, I hate to put it this way, and I'm going to sound like a sexist, but it's true. I'm sorry. But the reason they love representing women is it's far more easier to get them mad and get them, I'm going to get 100% custody. Dads in general will go, look, I want to split it, right? Usually 50-50 right. or something like that. Moms don't. And if they can stir those emotions up, they can make tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I can't tell you the number of times I've seen that. And that's where you have to understand that if you're seeing a lawyer and you're meeting with them and they're they're spewing at you trying to get you mad, you want to steer away from that person because what they're trying to do is gin up billable hours. It's not about trying to resolve yeah. your case. It's how much can I extract from this family before they run out of money and then magically the case resolves itself in the next day. It's amazing how many people fall for that. And, and I'm sorry if it's sexist to say it, but mom's do it all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that that's an interesting point. We should talk about money, Dan. I, um, I was going to go there. Go ahead. Uh, so, so um, a lot of dads also ask, you know, should I get a lawyer or not? Or I'm losing because I don't have a lawyer. Um, I found that I, I, I spent like $200,000 in my three year custody battle and I ended up bankrupt, no assets and tons of debt. Mm -hmm. um, but I got custody and, you know, I've been rebuilding my life since then. It's going well. But, um, a, a lawyer, there's a, a dad can hire a lawyer and pay $400,000 and still lose. A dad can hire a lawyer and pay $400,000 and win. You can have no lawyer and you can win or you can lose. Whether or not you have a lawyer does not determine the outcome of your custody case necessarily. Um, and, and whether you pay a lot of money to that lawyer doesn't determine the outcome necessarily. The outcome is mostly determined based on the facts of who you are as a person, mm -hmm. who the mother is as a person, and the actual facts of who you are as they relate to the best interest of the child and what's truly better for that child. And on top of that, layer on top of that, because that's reality, right? Let's say that God knows out of these two parents, God knows everything about them and God knows the truth, but God's not talking to us and telling us. So once you know that truth, on top of that, you have a judge to convince. So does the judge understand the reality? And third, how good are you at explaining the story in the construct of the best interest of the child of what you're good at and why it's good for the child? What's the mom good or bad at and why is that good or bad for the child? How well can you tell that story to that judge? And that dynamic will um, impact the outcome of your case. I think you're, you're touching on something that I think is that guys in particular need to do, which is take a step back, take a breath and think about your capabilities and don't overrate or underrate yourself. Right. So like you're talking about presenting a case, if you're going to go pro se, neither one of us is attorneys, I guess we should say that we're right. not giving That's legal right. advice or any of that, but if you're going to decide to go pro se, you need to understand, and we're, we're going to explore this a little bit. What's involved with that. And are you capable of doing that? That That is the biggest mistake I see guys do that do ultimately, whether they, sometimes you have to go pro se because you just can't afford a lawyer. That happens, all right? That's realistic. Right. But if you're, if you're going to sit and do an assessment on yourself and say, all right, this is what I need to do if I'm going to go pro se. And you honestly say to yourself, you know what? I can't do that. And be honest about it because... And we'll discuss this. What's involved? You're talking hours and hours of time commitment. Can you understand the level of it? You know, when you're when you're reading case law and you're not an attorney, it can be difficult to understand. I, I 
For whatever reason, I was fairly good at it. I know you were. But a lot of guys aren't, and that's not a knock on them. That's just who they are. It's reality. It is reality. And if you're not willing to do that, that it, like you said, should I hire a lawyer or not? The first question you need to ask is, in my opinion, is am I capable of doing what needs to be done or not? Because ultimately, to me, that's what's going to drive whether you should hire an attorney or not, or whether you and then cost comes into play. What are your thoughts on, or and maybe even touch on, what's involved with representing yourself? Lots of torture. <laughs> that's a great way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> it is torture. So let me tell yeah. you, reading legal briefs is the best sleeping medication there is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and um, you know, I... So I had a lawyer for my custody case the whole time, and I, I kind of I needed that ally on my side who understood the system and how it was supposed to work and to have that sounding board. Um, I could have spent I probably spent well, well over one hundred thousand dollars on him and his legal fees alone, and I could have spent maybe half that much um, if I had to do it all over again. Um, and so what I teach on my videos is how to do all the preparation yourself so your lawyer doesn't have to. But in, in terms of presenting your case, the biggest part that's supposed to be the most important part is what's reality what's the truth about you and the mother and the children to determine what's really best for the kids mm -hmm. and that's like I, I like to call that part the intelligent conversation about the future of my children and then but it because it happens in family court the judge is a lawyer the lawyers are lawyers the court clerks are just little minions running around working for lawyers the entire culture is a law culture by law people who are incompetent at really thinking about this family and the family dynamics and what's best for the kid. And they focus on all of these legal briefs. You know, I need to do a, an order to show cause to have an emergency thing done, or maybe I need to file a motion to change venue, or maybe I need to file a motion to change the judge, or maybe I need to file a motion um, to punish the mother for not letting me have parenting time. Maybe I have to file a violation petition because she um, would not let me see the kids during my weekend and she violated the court order. Maybe it's a violation petition. Maybe it's a motion for contempt um, against her. Um, and, and I have to file a, uh, an offer of proof document, which is something that is a list of my witnesses and why they are relevant and why they need to testify. Um, you know, there's all of these motions that you have to do, which in my mind are just like so much nonsense. It's not the core issue. And all of these motions have to be written a certain way, formatted a certain way. Mm -hmm. Each motion that you submit has to ask, there's a legal question that you want the judge to answer um, and you're giving them the answer and you have to write it in that way so that the judge can say, I agree with you or I disagree. And then if she files a motion, do you have 20 days to respond? 10 days or 30 days? It varies by state. There's 50 states with 50 sets of laws. So people like me and Dan can't tell you the rule because there's 50 sets of rules. And so you have to learn that. And if you if she files a motion, you have 30 days to respond, for example. Does she now have seven days to respond or 14? Or does she not respond at all? If I file an order to show cause, which is more of an urgent emergency thing, an order to show cause is the mother should give me the child tomorrow because it's my parenting time and she's refusing. And we need to deal with this in court tomorrow. Well, does the mother reply with an order to show cause or not? And how do you submit the order to show cause? Do you give it to the court clerk or the judge? Do you file it electronically? Um, when do you file it? What's the proper form? Do you have to sign it? Do you have to have it notarized? Mm -hmm. What what date do you put on it? Um, do you have to serve the mother? Um, can you email it to the mother and say, hey, by the way, we're going to court on Tuesday for this emergency thing? Or do you have to send it to her by mail? Or do you have to have um, somebody serve her, a, a service processor? Like there's so many rules. I spent like years learning these rules because I needed to be as good as my lawyer at them because I didn't rely on my lawyer for execution. Um, he helped me a lot, mm -hmm. but I learned a lot and I was able to do it on my own because I knew I, I just couldn't outsource this stuff to a third party lawyer. I loved my lawyer. He's a nice guy. We're still friends today, but this was so important. Everything that was happening was so important. I couldn't just say, I'm hiring a lawyer. He'll take care of it. That's the wrong mindset. Exactly. I own the entire process. And that's that's the key point right there is you need to own the entire process. Now, if, if you come to the conclusion to yourself that 
you know what? Because everything that Father X just talked about, you need to, to understand in depth. You know, if you're filing a show cause, you can't just whip out a piece of paper and write it. It's got to be on the proper document, whether it may be notarized, how it's going to be, sir, all this stuff. You need to know that stuff cold. And you may laugh when I say this if you're listening in, but you put the wrong punctuation in the wrong place. I'm exaggerating. That could throw the whole thing out. But as ludicrous as it sounds, I've seen stuff along those lines. You know, if you're if you're trying to counter an argument that's being made on a legal basis, you may need mm -hmm. to have citations from actual yeah. case. If you are incapable of going to that level, you need to consider hiring a lawyer. It's why I used a lawyer for all of my custody issues, because I knew I wasn't capable of getting to that level, even though I did everything. That said, you do need to do your homework so that you understand all right, well, you know, if, if we're going, let's say a show cause, we're going to have to do this. This is my lawyer doing it all correctly. Can I do some of it? Because that can save you a ton of money if you're doing some of it. I save right. tens of thousands of dollars doing my own. Um, you know, it's much cheaper to pay a lawyer to review something you've written than to have them write it, even though mm -hmm. I hate to break it to you kids, but the majority of the time it's cut and paste from another document that they, that's how they do it. But anyway, <laughs> um, that, you know, that's your decision, right? And understanding that can help protect you uh, and understanding what's involved with a lot of these processes. Um, if we can, let's just briefly talk about filing an appeal because I- Can I add, Dan? Can go I, ahead. Dan, no, can go, I add please, to, to the documentation? Do. Please do. There, there's there's a, a really important part about what you talked about representing yourself and am I going to do the legal work? Let me tell you the risk that you're facing in court. As a general rule of thumb, when I look at all these court people, I my general conclusion is judges don't know the law. They make up the law as they go along and mm -hmm. they violate the law in order to just rubber stamp the mother for custody um, in terms of procedure and in terms of decision making. And I told you before that my first appearance in court, they just gave the mother custody because she was available to parents, ignoring the fact that she was violent and knife wielding and crazy. Um, so judges will ignore the best interest factors that the law says they're supposed to follow um or maybe the appellate courts if you read appellate court decisions appellate which i do in episodes 10 of my series i talk about appellate court decisions those rules are what the higher court said you're supposed to make child decisions child custody decisions based on judges have to follow that mm -hmm. judges don't judges ignore the law in order to rubber stamp the mother so you have to be able to read all of the rules so that you know what the rules are. And honestly, you could just shove it down the judge's throat because they will violate the rules for convenience because you have to remember the judge also cares about the best interests of the judge. What's in my best interest as a judge? I have 100 cases on my docket this week. I need to get through them. How do I get through them fast? I rubber stamp the mother each time. I don't ask questions. If I ask questions, it complicates the story and makes my job harder. So churn and burn, factory model. Let me go through it. Yeah, it's funny because you started touching on what I wanted to cover on the appellate side, right? Is okay. A lot of guys assume, all right, the judge didn't give me what I wanted, whatever that might be, right? I'm going to file an appeal. Now, the paperwork involved with that is, in many ways, totally different than what you got to file in, paper, in family court and all that. Right. There's a whole process behind it. And I've seen guys churn and burn so much money and they never stood a chance to begin with because the thing that people don't understand is the appellate court's job is not to rule on the judge's decision per se it's did he follow proper procedure in coming to that decision and you could just touched on it they yeah. give them a ton of latitude in fact no other judge has as much latitude as a family court judge it's not even remotely close Right. So if you're filing an appeal and you're basically saying, well, I think the judge screwed up, you just whatever amount of money you just spent to do that, you just threw in the trash. You have to document it. You have to say this is specifically what the judge did wrong. Here is the case law that supports it or the statute, whatever it might yep. be. And yep. you have to when I say dot your I's and cross your T's times 10 because the appellate yep. court's job is to only rule did the judge make a legal mistake and yeah. 
they they will cut them so much. I've read I don't know how many appellate court decisions that went against dads primarily because I was trying to learn the process myself, and they would find the stupidest things to toss it back. And the other thing to keep yeah. in mind is if you're going to go to appellate court, even if you win, the re net result almost always is they're going to kick it back to the same judge that screwed up the first time. Yeah, yeah. And you're just going to have a pissed off judge because you said on it, it's, you know, judges don't want appellate courts reversing their decisions. If you get to that point, trust me, my friend, you are dealing with a judge that is going to hate you. Yeah. So what you is want your... the appellate court to decide. You want to ask the appellate court based on this. I want you to decide appellate court guy, not the judge. Let's not go through a trial again. You decide. Hey, um, go ahead. You know, what's interesting, Dan, is you mentioned that you read a lot of appellate court cases and they went against the dad. And you know, there's 50 states and each one has their appellate court customs and traditions and mm -hmm. and the like. So it gets complicated. But I will tell you that when I was reading appellate court law during my um, whole trial process because I knew my judge was getting it all wrong and I was reading appellate court law to figure out what is supposed to really be happening here and then how do I force the judge and handcuff the judge so they have to abide by the law instead of just rubber stamping the mother and when I read hundreds of appellate court cases the general sense that I got was the way this process works is the lower court rubber stamps the mother for custody for no intelligent thought and if a father appeals it then the appellate court will rule and say, wait a minute, the judge violated the law. And a lot of the cases I read were the appellate court saying the judge violated the law by ignoring the best interest factors. And the mm -hmm. appellate court overturned many of them in favor of the father. But I know that in some states, the appellate courts rubber stamp the judge's decision like 95 percent of the time. So it varies by state. It does. It, you know, my case, particular case, it was New York. Um, but I've read you know, appellate law and others, because sometimes I was looking for, I remember one time I was looking for um, something and I ended up reading, uh, I believe it was Kansas. And I was mm -hmm. actually citing that in the paperwork, even though, you know, I was in New York. I'm like, but Kansas has done this and, you know, maybe we should consider it type thing. And right. there, that's where, again, you've got to know your level of ability. Um, and, and I'm not saying that Father X or I are any better than any of you watching at being able to do this. What makes us, I guess, more capable is that we put in the time to learn. And yeah. we're both, and I, I think you'll concur on this, we're talking hundreds, if not thousands upon thousands of hours. It's a full time job. It was yes. for me. And that's what people need to understand because I see so many guys just piss money away because i'm going to file an appeal and you spent you might spend if you have a, an attorney doing it you might spend five ten thousand just filing it and it's going to get tossed the minute that paper hits the appellate court's docket because they're going to look at it and go yeah you missed this part here and there's no legal reason for us to look at it kick it and uh, they're always looking for a reason to kick it you have to understand that and you and got it's important to it's important to get in your trial you have testimony and you have evidence. The appellate court can only hear what was presented at trial and what was presented exactly. as evidence. Because the appellate court can only hear what the judge heard. It's like a replay of what the judge heard. You can't introduce new evidence. You can't say, oh, I forgot to talk about this. The judge got it wrong because of ABC evidence. Oh, I never produced that evidence, but here it is. No, like you have to produce everything at trial and then whatever you presented gets reheard right. or not reheard. Yeah, I mean, the research I did, mind you, this is 20 years ago. When it comes to filing appeals, it's somewhere less than 5% that I found got overturned. And that's the real reality of it all. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but you need to have an honest conversation with yourself and with your attorney if you've got one, uh, the realities of it. And then decide whether it's worthwhile. Because the other side of things that I've always talked about is people will spend... I remember one guy I was coaching not too long ago. He had spent $30,000 in attorney's fees to save himself $100 a month in child support. He won, wow. by the way. He did win. He got, wow. it, he got it reduced by $100. And I said, your child was, I think it was 10 or 11 at the time. You got, what, six, seven, eight years at $100 a month. That's $1,200 a year. That's ten grand. You spent $20,000 you lost $20,000. Again, yeah. you have to be smart with these decisions and do what's 
the best, you know, it might be a nightmare, but you got to do what's best for you and the child to the, to a certain level, but also understand the realities of it all. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I like to get away from filing motion after motion because I like the core topic of what's best for my child. All these legal motions are nonsense. Sometimes you have to file them, um, you know, violation petitions, et cetera. But you can't waste money on the legal nonsense that lawyers love to argue about. That's what buys lawyers, boats, vacation homes, and all that is when they start getting that legal nonsense going. And keep in mind, it only takes one bad apple in a case. You know, yeah. you, you might have the best attorney in the world, but if she's got a bad one, because that was my situation. I mean, her attorney was atrocious. Um, and, and, you know, we had a guardian at Lightham. I've shared this story before where the judge literally looked at her. It was me against her in a particular case. Was my ex was there, but it was the the gal, as I call her, guardian at light against mm -hmm. me, and I ate her alive. And the judge literally looked at her and said, "He knows the law better than you do, so shut up." <laughs> yes, yeah, that yeah, the that's your goal. That's the what you sweetest want. moment of my life, probably at this point, um, yeah. was when he did that. But that's. That's, you know, where you've got to get to. We've got a, only a couple of minutes left, Father X. I wanted to kind of give you an opportunity. I know we've touched on so many things, and I'm trying to highlight things so that people understand. If you really want to dig into depth on what Father X is talking about, you need to go watch his videos. So can you go and give us an overview? You've already started to on your channel. Mm -hmm. And really, where if someone were to go to your channel, what would you say? Where's the starting point? What should people focus on? So uh, I created my channel as a series of educational videos. And I outlined the whole thing in a way that I wish I knew these things on day one or before day one in this order. Um, and I'm making videos in that order. So I have episode one, episode 2A and 2B, episode 3A, 3B, 3C, all on different topics. And so you should watch them sequentially and have a playlist on my channel where I just put the videos in order and you can watch the playlist. Um, and each one is about 15 minutes long, teaching you what you need to know. Um, like episode two talks about the definitions of what's primary custody, what is legal custody, what is sole custody, what is an order of protection? Let's just start with that. And then episode three talks about lawyers and do I want a lawyer? What are the weaknesses of the lawyers? How much should I spend on a lawyer? How do I save money on a lawyer? And episode four is how do I behave in court? Not just to be a nice guy, but strategically, um, how do I behave um, in court so that the judge likes me instead of hating me more? because they already start off hating you. And then in episodes five, six, seven, eight, I talk about different topics. Like episode eight is how to negotiate a custody agreement outside of court, like a reasonable, real custody agreement. Um, chapter, uh, episode nine is about the silver bullet. Episode 10 is about appellate state laws and, and reading case law. Episode 11 that I'm doing right now is about how to write your testimony and how to prepare your testimony based on the best interest factors. So I break down all of these pieces um, to help dads figure out how to do this if you have a lawyer or if you don't. Because even if you have a lawyer, you're not outsourcing this work to him. You have to do it yourself. And it takes a long time. It's a lot of effort. I spent sleepless nights for three years in agony, night in and night out, painful, but I did it and I got through it. And I've been raising my son ever since. And, and that's the best thing that I've ever done in my life is to raise my son. If I may add to what you just said, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying this because he's in front of me or has joined me as a guest. In my opinion, the series that you're doing and, and have done is hands down the best series I've ever seen for fathers. And, wow. and I don't say that lightly. And, and let's understand, you're not an attorney. You're not giving legal advice. But yet the advice you do give and the, and the way you're educating men is something i've never seen an attorney who's you know i've seen if they have all these you know cases or uh what am i trying what's the word i'm looking for courses sorry courses that you can buy and all this crap and it is a lot of it is crap you're giving it all away free by the way okay but yes. you present it in a way that's easily understandable also you you don't get lost in the the jargon uh, you're, you're coming at it as a dad 
right? And here, here's the realities. You're, you're, if I may presume, though, you're being pretty blunt deliberately in many cases, but you're telling them mm-hmm. what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. Whereas attorneys, you know, I've read all, all how to help yourself in court, all this crap. I, I can't tell you how many books I've read. And I'm when I read them, I look at them as this is an attorney that's trying to gin up business, right? Or he's right, he's written this book so he can claim he wrote a book um, and get clients that way. That's they tend to do that. Whereas you are doing it, honestly, you're doing it from the heart. Um, and you the way you present it is brilliant, if I may say that. And and again, I am not I don't make a cent off it because he doesn't charge anything anyway. Um, <laughs> I, I, get, I have no skin in the game, but that's why I wanted to have you on is primarily to so that people understand there is a resource out there that is absolutely brilliant. And, and I, I can say this with some expertise myself. Uh, I, I honestly could not do what you did I, to that level. And, and I appreciate you. And I want to thank you on behalf of all dads. Um, and honestly, even some moms, because there's a lot of moms out there that can learn from it too. The good moms, right? Right. right. Uh, or step moms, right? That are trying to help their husbands and grandmothers. Grandmothers, yeah. mothers of, um, you know, a, I've even a couple of your cases. I could even relate to mothers who have been with adoptions because I know of one that I would say go watch this because she's trying to fight an adoption type situation. It's I'm not going to get into it, uh, but. I truly appreciate that you've put that channel together. And I, and I want to personally thank you publicly too, to say brilliant job, my friend, absolutely brilliant job. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate that. I appreciate that feedback because uh, it's all coming from my heart and soul and, and what I've lived through. And I know that um, when I was going through it, I always felt that I had to move mountains in order to get primary custody of my son, which was the obviously correct thing to do, but it still required moving mountains. And, Moving mountains is not easy, but I did it. And I, I it's my responsibility to, to share that because I know what other dads are up against. And also, Dan, my son will grow up to be a man and hopefully a father one day. I do not want him to grow up in a world where if he has a child and breaks up with the mother of that child, that by default, he is going to be thrown off to the side by the family court system because that's what they do. So my hope is to change the world with my video series and have enough men um, represent themselves and represent their case well enough that instead of 10 or 15% of fathers getting primary custody over the next few years, maybe it becomes 30% because I'm teaching guys what to do. And then my son can grow up in a different world. That, that's a primary goal. That's that should be the main goal for anyone. And for anyone who wants to check out the channel, I'm going to put the link in the show notes so that you can go find it, but it's at father X. 2022 on youtube correct yes yeah uh, any are you on any other social medias I, I i'm actually, only on youtube okay i, I didn't know that's why i wanted to ask you so um as i said i will put links uh, uh down on the show notes so that you can check it out all right father x we got to wrap things up but i want to give you just a last moment if there's anything else you want to add to the conversation or anything else you think people should know yeah uh what i want to tell dads is um, I mentioned before, this might be one of the hardest things you have to, you have to do is fight for custody of your kids. Um, they might be the darkest days of your life. You might have to move mountains, but you should figure out that if you have to move mountains and it's required to do, you can do it. Uh, don't ever underestimate the amount of energy and passion and ability in your heart and soul to keep going forward. If you think you're depressed and sad and it's too hard, and you're running on empty, that doesn't matter. Keep running on empty. You can always go more. You can always do more. You can always spend another hour on Tuesday night reading case law because there is no limit to the amount of energy you can have to fight for your children. Um, So believe in yourself and just take one more step because taking those extra steps when you don't think you can, that's what makes all the difference in the world. I concur with everything you said. I would just add as a dad who did it all, it's probably the pride of my life that I was able to do what I did and that I did do it. As hard as it was, as heartbreaking it was, as it was. There were many, like you said, sleepless nights, but it's the best thing I think I've ever done in my life. And I think you would probably say the same thing at this point. Yes, easily. Raising my son is the best thing there by you. far. And that's that's the only motivation you should need. 
Father X, I want to say a sincere thank you for coming on the show. Um, and I hope to have you back on because we covered a lot of ground and I was trying to cover as much as I can, but there's a lot we didn't cover. So down the road, we can, we can talk about so many more topics. <laughs> also. So many, uh, I'd love to have you back on, uh, down the road and, and maybe cover some of the things that we have it. Cause it, this is just a wealth of information and I highly encourage everyone to go to his channel and watch the videos. But from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming on my show and thank you for everything you do. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. All right. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. I plan on it. All right, my friends, what an awesome show. I, I hope if you've watched this far, you've learned a lot. And if you're a dad that's dealing with a potential custody battle, or maybe you've already had one and you need to look at revising things or making some changes this is a good source to start and then jump on over to father x's channel and again my ultimate goal with my channel is to educate people to get people to under both men and women by the way to get them to understand that the issues men and boys face are are not just unique to you they're you they're not unique in any way all of us have to deal with them. Even those of us that aren't dealing with family court, it still affects people. So the more that we can educate people and get people to understand what men and boys have to deal with in a society that frankly doesn't like them very much, that's why I do what I do. If you've watched this far, do me that favor. Give me that thumbs up. Give me that like. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Um, I have a new podcast coming out pretty much every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And I'm going to leave it at that. You all have a great week and we'll see you next time on Men Need to Be Heard.